Yeah, good afternoon from my side as well, and welcome to our conference call. There's nothing specific I would like to add uh, right now, so I hand over directly to Julio. Hi, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. I'm pleased to present to you the numbers for the third quarter. But before we go into the third quarter numbers, we can take a look at the picture as of uh, September 2018, and we can go to page uh, number three. As you see, we have very strong results for the first nine months across the board. That When you look at the revenue, we have been able to grow revenue on an internal basis by about 7%, and the growth is driven by all segments, especially it's very nice to see the growth rate in PNC, which is uh, close to 6%. On the operating profit, we are up uh, 400 million compared to the level of, of last year. This is driven especially by property and casualty, and you can see also a nice contribution coming from asset management. On the life side, we are slightly down compared to the last year, but we need to consider that uh, last year was kind of elevated because the volatility in the United States was uh, particularly low. And even more important, with 3.2 billion of operating profit, we are very much in line with our outlook for the year of 4.2 uh, billion. When you look at the operational KPIs like combined ratio, new business margin, cost income ratio, they are all heading, heading in the right direction. Especially you can see a nice improvement in the combined ratio, which is now for the nine months at 94%, which is also the level that we are targeting for the full year based on our renewal agenda target. The new business margin has slightly improved. And combined with uh, increased revenue, this is leading to a nice growth in a BNB of about 9%. The flows here to date are at about 30 billion, so that's also a nice picture. And then when you look at the bottom line, so we look at the net income, we are up uh, 7%. Compared to the prior period, this is driven once by the improvement of operating profit. On the other side, we have also a better tax ratio, which is mostly explained by the tax reform in the United States. So, you know, when you look at this page, I think the picture is really uh, compelling. We have good growth in revenue. We have uh, operational KPIs moving uh, in, the, in the right direction, and the net income and the earning per shares are growing very uh, nicely. If we move to page five, we can now go into the third quarter numbers. And also the third quarter on a standalone basis is uh, very strong. On the revenue side, you can see always on an internal basis that we have a growth rate which is almost 10%. This is driven by all segments, so we have a nice growth rate in uh, property and casualty, which is consistent with the growth rates that we saw also in the prior quarters. We have a nice growth rate in life health, even better than what we saw in the prior quarter, and we see a nice stability in the growth in revenue in uh, asset uh, management. The operating profit has increased substantially compared to the prior period. You can see there is a swing of 500 million. Clearly, in the prior period, especially on the PNC side, we had the impact of the natural catastrophe, but it remains that with 3 billion operating profit for the quarter, we are at a very good level. And again, the net income has improved significantly compared to the prior period, and this is driven by, especially by the increase in the operating uh, uh, profit of 20% uh, plus. So good picture also for the quarter, which is confirming the numbers that we saw also in the first half and especially in the second quarter of 2018. We can move now to page 7 where we uh, see the development of uh, the Shiroda equity and on the solvency tool. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the solvency tool um, capital quote, which is about 229. It's very stable compared to the solvency ratio that we had in uh, uh, at the end of last year and also at the end of uh, uh, June. I'm going to come back uh, in one second to describe the different driver of the movement of the solvency ratio. When you look at the sensitivities, are uh, pretty much unchanged compared to the sensitivities that we had as of uh, June 2018. The only exception is the sensitivity to interest rates, which is uh, now minus 7. If you remember, the sensitivity was more like minus 10 in Q2, and the, the sensitivity was minus 7 in Q1. So we are going back to the level that we had 
at the beginning of the year, and that's because, as you're going to see later, you have a little bit longer duration on the exercise compared to the duration of the liability, so we have a little bit of a, a higher duration uh, gap. If you move to page 9, uh, you can see what are the drivers of the development of the solvency ratio. First, we had a small change uh, impact due to the tax reform in the United States, and that's because uh, with the change in the tax reform in the United States, when you run the calculation of the RBC capital, we have less of a tax offset if you want uh, in the capital charges, and this is increasing the capital charges, so that's about 1%, and this was also expected. On the operating earnings, you can see on a pre-tax, pre-dividend basis, we have an improvement of the solvency ratio of 9%, which is pretty much in line with uh, what we saw also in the prior quarter. There is one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the business evolution, which is now plus 0 0.2. In the last uh, quarters, if you take aside the second quarter, where I think we had 0 0.1, usually we were seeing more a, a number of zero. It's now slightly negative. The reason why we see a plus now is twofold. On the one side is the PNC uh, is growing. So as we grow the PNC uh, uh, premium, we can see also there is uh, an increase in capital associated to that business. And then on the other side is also the growth in uh, Allianz Life uh, is picking up. And also we were not including the business evolution, the Allianz Life in the past because the Allianz Life is on a uh, equivalent basis, but now we are including also Allianz Life in the in the picture. Market movements have been uh, very minor, so no uh, significant impact at all coming from the market movement. And then on the capital management action, you can see the impact of dividend and the buyback of one billion that we, we paid in um, in the third quarter. And then the tax and others mostly explained by the uh, tax position. So the bottom line is, if you were to adjust our solvency ratio for the buyback, the solvency ratio of 229 will be 232, and that will be pretty much. Uh, in line, if you want, with uh, what we would expect in the absence of the reg regulatory change in the United States. So nothing really uh, exciting happening on the solvency ratio, and again, a very strong solvency uh, ratio. If you go to page 11, you can see the, the, the picture of uh, for selected OEs uh, for the growth rate in property casualty. Again, we had a very strong uh, growth in PNC with uh, 6%. Now, one of the drivers for the, the growth compared to the past is Germany, which is growing very nicely at uh, 4%, and Germany is growing in uh, personal and also in uh, sorry, retail business and also commercial business. It's growing more to property, so it's a nice growth rate across the board. Also, Italy, you can see, is now positive. It's uh, more than 1% growth. That's, that has not been the case in the past. Uh, in the last year, we were still negative, and then slowly, slowly, we have seen a recovery in our uh, production in Italy, so now we are at 1.4% positive. Then you have the user suspect, like Australia, uh, Eastern Europe, and Spain, and the negative, the only negative that you see on this slide is uh, the United Kingdom, and this is somehow associated to the trans tra transfer of business between us and the V. And clearly, as we are transferring our personal line business to LV, there is a little bit of a slowdown in production. When you look simply at the commercial business, which is the core business of Allianz UK, then you can see a nice growth rate of 4% on the business too. Then finally, uh, just a couple of words on AGCNS and Eula Hermes. You can see a growth rate of 10% for both entities. There is some seasonality in the case of the GCS is associated to the IT uh, business. In the case of Eula Hermes, is more um, associated to the, the way the accounting can work. But if you adjust for this seasonality, the growth rate in the GCS and Eula Hermes is about uh, uh, 5%, which is a gro good uh, growth rate. And also something that we are not seeing for Eula Hermes in, uh, in, the, in the past too. So across the board, I would say nice uh, growth rate, nice movement a nice increase again in the top uh, top line. Coming to page 13, on the operating profit side, you can see a nice uh, improvement. And as I was saying before, clearly this has to do also with the swing in natural catastrophe uh, from 4.5% last year to 2% this year. 
but this is not the only driver for the uh, improvement. You can see that the expense ratio is also improved compared to last year. Uh, on the other side, the runoff has been uh, lower compared to the high runoff that we had in the third quarter of 2017. And then we have also, that's very important, an improvement of the attritional loss ratio. So at the end of the day, the bottom line is uh, better productivity, uh, lower natural catastrophe, and under underlying improvement of the attritional loss ratio are pushing the combined ratio to a, a very good level of uh, 93.1. As you remember, we are 94 as of uh, the nine months, so we feel very confident at this point in time that we're going to hit our 94. I had to put, as usual, a disclaimer about uh, natural catastrophe, but for the time being, in the first uh, six, seven weeks of the, of, the, of the quarter, we didn't see any particular, particular activity affecting us in a, in, in a way that could uh, uh, make our, our confidence in 94% uh, uh, less. Coming now to page 15, you can see on the combined ratio, when you just look at the delta in combined ratio compared to the prior period, you can see a lot of minus uh, sign if you want. You have an improvement in Germany that's driven by a better expense ratio and also and especially by lower large losses and weather related losses compared to the prior period. We have a nice improvement in Eastern Europe where we are continuing to uh, improve our underlying performance and on top of that we had uh, also um, lower um, large losses. Spain is uh, also improving and then I would say also in Latin America, you can see that uh, we are uh, constantly improving our, our position there. Um, on the company with a plus sign, Italy, just because of a slightly lower runoff, but we are speaking still of a very, very excellent, I would say, uh, combined ratio. And now as we see uh, a GCS, that's an improvement, clearly. And you can see we had lower uh, natural catastrophe compared to the uh, prior period, um, but the improvement in the combined ratio is less than the lower amount of natural catastrophe, and the reason for that is in reality that we had uh, large losses and also weather-related losses this year, which were in excess of the large losses and weather-related losses that we had last year. So the bottom line is that the GCS is still running. Uh, at a high, high uh, combined, combined ratio. So last year the reason was uh, uh, natural catastrophe, and this year we are affected by large losses and weather related losses, and still we have a nice load, let's put this way, coming from the natural catastrophe. The bottom line is when you look at the segment, 93.1 combined ratio, so I think it's a very, very good level, and combined with the growth rate of 6%, I believe both the uh, technical excellence on the on the combined ratio and our commercial ability to grow the premium, in my opinion, are clearly coming through through the numbers. Page 17, investment income, as you can see, is uh, pretty resilient. Indeed, the investment income in the third quarter of 18 is just uh, is less than 20 million lower compared to the prior period. So, from that point of view, we see resilience in our operating investment results. I don't know if you remember the second quarter number, but they were also pretty resilient. So overall, we see more resilience in the numbers compared to what we were expecting at the beginning of the year. And with that, I will go into the live segment. As you, as you know, we have three targets at page 19. Uh, for the live segment, we have given us uh, three targets. One target is we like to have a new business margin which is above uh, 3%. As you see, this is the case with 3.5, and we have been kind of moving at this level for a while right now. The second target is that we want to have more than 80% of production in uh, the so-called preferred products, and as you see, in the third quarter, we are at 84, so this is confirming a trend that you already saw in the last uh, quarters. The third one also is we like to grow the revenue, and when you look at the present value of the business premium on the right hand side uh, in the in the table below, you can see there is an increase of about 12 percent compared to the prior period. So we also see a nice growth uh, kicking in. 
this is explained by Germany, and this is nothing new. Germany has been uh, growing now for, for a while, but we also see growth in uh, Italy, which has not been the case in the first half of the year, and we see also a nice growth in the United States where we had a sales promotion on the fixed index annuity side. So overall, I would say a very compelling case from a margin point of view, a mixed point of view, and also a growth of a revenue point of view. If we move to page 21, here we show the development of the operating profit, which is kind of stable compared to what we had uh, uh, last year. If you look at the waterfall, you can see the investment margin is slightly lower compared to the level last year. I'm going to come back in one second this number. Otherwise, the expenses are higher, but that's just the consequence of higher production. And these are expenses where we are not uh, decking the expenses here. The deck calculation uh, comes later. So clearly, as we see more production, we are going to have a higher level of expenses. On the other side, loadings and fees and technical margin are both uh, positive. So all in all, when you add up all the, the different components of the waterfall, you get to an operating profit which is relatively stable, and especially with uh, 1 billion and 50 million is exactly uh, the outflow divided by four. I like to draw you also your attention when you look at the protection and health. You can see that the operating profit went down by about 40 million, and this is pretty much explained by a small loss recognition, the LTC business in the United States. I'm sure you're going to have a few questions later, so I'll leave this for the question. But at the end of the day, it's a very small small amount uh, of loss recognition, the uh, long-term care business. Mm -hmm. At page 23, we, you can see that the value of business is accelerating to uh, 16%, and that's clearly the consequence of a uh, to, to a certain degree, also of an increased margin, but in reality, it's mostly driven by the 12% present value of business growth that you saw before. Overall, it's a very uh, compelling picture from from a value of business growth, I would say, across the board. Now, when you look at the operating profit, just focusing on the two major OEs, Germany Life and United States, you can see they are, slight, they are down compared to the prior period. But in reality, that's more of a normalization, if you want. If you compare those the numbers in operating profit for Germany Life and USA to the airplane, are very much in line, I would say, or just slightly below what we would expect for, for a quarter. So just to give you an idea, in the case of the United States last year, the volatility was very low. This year is more normal. Then we are able to see impact, but still, at 220 million of operating profit, this is not far from what we would expect for a quarter for Allianz uh, Life. So this tells you about also the, the resilience that we have in our operation. And now coming to page 25, that's the investment uh, margin picture. As you see, the uh, investment margin expressed in basis points is reduced by two basis points. And if you do the annualization, the 21 basis points, you get to 80, 84 a basis point, which is below the 90 basis point or 90 to 95 basis point guidance that we gave to you. And this is not the first quarter. It happened also, uh, I believe, in the other quarter. One of the reasons, the main reason why this is happening right now is uh, because of the, of the net harvesting and other. As you see, is uh, now negative at three uh, basis points. And the reason for that is uh, twofold. First of all, last year there was a benefit because of the low cost in, uh, of the hedging VA. But the other reason is in our investment portfolio in Euro, we are also have uh, US dollar bonds. And we do a hedging theory for the a fixed exposure and the hedging costs are going up. So this is dragging right now um, a little bit the investment margin. Now, on the other side, the aggregate Policy reserves is going up by 5%, so the margin is coming down a little bit, but the basis is going up. So when you look at the absolute uh, reduction in uh, investment margin, in reality, it's pretty, pretty small. And again, we have other sources of profit which are picking up, like technical margin or loadings and fees. So uh, the bottom line is that we are comfortably making our $1 billion plus of operating profit per, per annum. And with that, I'd like to come now to asset management. Uh, first of all, we have achieved the threshold of $2 trillion of total asset management. This includes also the assets managed for our operation. 
So I think that's more of a statistical information, but it tells you a little bit about the scale and size of our operation. And as you know, scale uh, counts in asset management, counts in every business, but definitely counts in asset management. So that's a nice number to uh, to have in a piece also really for the quality of the franchises that we have been built over the last uh, years. When we are focusing only on the uh, third party assets under management, you can see that uh, there was a, a slight increase compared to the level of um, uh, June. But especially it's nice to see that we had positive flows at uh, both Pinko and DGI uh, of about 15 billion in uh, aggregate. And so if you remember the second quarter, we had some negative flow. The first quarter was pretty strong. So you can see that a uh, little bit depending on the market volatility, we, 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 we go from having positive to having negative flows. But in general, we feel very, very good about uh, uh, the resilience of uh, our operation in a market which is not always uh, easy. Another question is going to come, what is happening to the flows now, the volatility is picking up in the fourth quarter. Uh, we, in the, the month of October, or yet, yet let's say quarter to date, uh, flows, net, net flows are down uh, 10 billion, uh, which is not unexpected when you have this kind of volatility. We still believe, first of all, it's not really that significant uh, if you want for, for the operating performance of, uh, of our operation, considering the size that we have. And I personally still believe that increasing interest rates are a long-term positive. You might get some volatility in the short term, but eventually when the volatility reduced, uh, we are going to be even in better shape than we are now, and we are in pretty good shape right now, so uh, I think it's just weathering the volatility for a few quarters. Um, also, another information, because I know you're always very sensitive on this topic, uh, on the three and five years performance, benchmark performance, uh, PINCO is over 90%. 90% of the funds of PINCO, more than 90% of the funds of PINCO are beating the benchmark. So when you, when you have these kind of numbers, I think the quarterly volatility on, on uh, flow shouldn't be of any of any concern. Now moving to page uh, 29, here we have a very nice uh, development, especially when you look on a quarter over quarter basis of the revenue. Uh, it's about 10 percent. It's also driven, um, if you want, from the performance fees at the GI. But even if you adjust for the performance fees at the GI, the increase in uh, basis fee is still pretty compelling. And now, also important, as you see, our uh, third-party assets under management margin is going up, both at PINC and TGI. Uh, it's been relatively stable in reality over the last quarter. And as you can see, uh, we don't see a, a sort of squeeze in margin because of all the you know things that you might uh, uh, be aware of in the you know in the in the publication. So, for, in our case, we are still capable to keep new business margin stable or indeed even to increase the new business, sorry, the margin fee compared to what we had uh, in, the, in, the last, uh, uh, in the last year. Moving to page 31, uh, the growth in uh, profit is uh, double digit when you also consider for a little bit of a push coming from the fixed effect, so it's a uh, nice uh, growth in uh, operating profit. If you look at but the cost income ratio, this is um, uh, going up, uh, 60 basis point, but that's also because of the consolidation, if you want to call it the way of ACP uh, in our in our asset management, ACP, just in the case you, you don't remember that, is our uh, is a company which is managing assets for, for Allianz and now is part of uh, uh, AGI. If you adjust for the consolidation of ACP, then the cost income ratio will be for the quarter flat compared to the level of the quarter 2017. Uh, you might be surprised it's flat. That's just because we had some one-off expenses at PINCO, and then also uh, we are investing. So the point is we are uh, investing PINCO in uh, technology and also the GI uh, in technology marketing expenses. So we are also not only growing our profit, but we are also setting the foundation for uh, further growth uh, moving uh, forward. So bottom line is 650 million of uh, operating profit is very uh, good profit for, for the quarter with a very nice increase uh, compared to the level last year. 
page 33, it's very exciting, so I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of questions on this uh, page. And with that, I will move to page uh, 35. And here you can see just the development uh, below the line. In reality, there is a little bit of noise in these numbers because of um, uh, the, the, the impact coming from ASPI, which is Autostrade per l'Italia. The point, if you look at the impairment, they look pretty high compared to the last year. This is mostly driven by the impairment on, Allian on um, Autostrade per l'Italia. But if you look down, you can see the non-controlling interest are positive. And the reason is the majority of the impairment that we are showing here in reality goes to minority. The bottom line is there is noise around the number. If you remove for the noise, I did the, clearly the calculation. We look at the number. There is really not much happening. Uh, below the line. And so from that point of view, when you look at the net income, you can see the net income is up more or less consistent with the development in operating profit after you take it, take into account for uh, taxes. And with that, I come to the last uh, page, 37, as you see. And as I was saying at the beginning of the, of the presentation, we are very good on the way, and especially when you look at the KPIs that we are most focusing on, uh, which is earning per share growth, ROE, combined ration PNC, also our ability to get to a good ROE in life at it, and new business margin, they are all uh, uh, going the right direction. So we are, we are pretty pleased with the performance that we had to date, and we are also confident for the remainder of the year. And with that, I would like to open up to your questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please ensure that the mute function on your telephone is switched off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Once again, for questions, please press star 1. We will take now our first question from Thomas Seidel from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Uh, first question on German PNC, where you had this uh, strong growth and also amazing improvement in current year loss ratio, which I suspect is mainly PFID rather than pricing driven. My question here is, I'm hearing a lot that the German motor market in particular is more competitive, and so first question is, what is your outlook uh, on Germany? Um, is it getting more competitive? Uh, should we expect less growth and also some margin compression, especially in the motor space? Uh, secondly, on life, I mean, when I look at the life operating results, there are three, you know, uh, unexpected things. Uh, the, the hedging costs, the low level of realized gains, and the low policyholder share. So maybe you can give some color on, you know, what is a normalized uh, rate of this, and also, you know, how long should we expect this FX hedging cost to be at this level? And finally, I wondered, I mean, you showed us a nine-month picture, and it, it looks nice, as you say, uh, what would be the 10-month picture, including October? So how have investments of Allianz fared uh, in the turmoil in October? I'm not sure I understood the last one. The, the last one is simply October, the, the capital market volatility. How, was, ah, okay. how is Allianz doing? Yeah. So I'll be starting from the German PNC uh, market and the motor development and so on. All, all, all can, I, can I tell you is the combined ratio in motor for Allianz Germany improved and didn't deteriorate as of uh, nine months and also look at the quarter. So at the end of the day, based on our numbers, I can tell you that the growth rate that we are seeing is now coming from compromise on profitability. And so we, we think that we are on a good, uh, good track and now we're going to see what happens during the renewal rates. But facts are that our combined ratio in, uh, in motor in Germany is, is now deteriorating. It is getting a little bit uh, uh, better. On uh, the investment margin issue, I, I would say that uh, the, 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 the issue with the high hedging cost is going to stay for a while, clearly. First of all, if you have higher volatility in the capital market, it is going to affect, the, for example, a little bit in the United States. And also the hedging cost on a U.S. dollar uh, portfolio that you want to hedge back in uh, euro are going to be elevated. But the point is, in this kind of environment, we are able to do our uh, 1 billion, 50 million operating profit. So I would say that uh, at the day, this is what uh, counts, and we feel pretty good about our ability to get uh, to this uh, 
to this number, and then clearly uh, we are also going to look at whether we need to deploy different strategy if this kind of hedging cost, especially on the um, U.S. dollar bond portfolio that we are hedging back, is uh, is uh, is a very level of performance that we would deem as not uh, adequate. But we we feel pretty good overall about the resilience of our profit in uh, in life. So I'm, I'm not concerned at all about uh, uh, what is happening there. The third question was how October looks like. We, maybe you are referring to whether we had a major natural catastrophe or these kind of things. No, I would say that uh, I, I would even tell you that I believe we are running slightly below the uh, budget. Uh, so from that point of view, there is nothing that I would particularly be – there is nothing right now. Now, as you know, December can always be kind of interesting, especially in uh, Germany and Northern Europe. But for the time being, it's, uh, yeah, it's um, very, very calm. On the investment performance, because Oliver is telling me this was your, your question, I wouldn't say there was anything special in, uh, in October compared to what we have been seeing uh, in, the last, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last months. Mm -hmm. And on German PNC, uh, my question was also more on the outlook. You say the renewal phase is coming. Do you expect more competition, or what, what is the outlook for Germany? I would say, you know, I believe the motor market is always competitive, so I don't think there is, you know, that uh, competition is the, if you, at the core of capitalism, so it is totally welcome, yeah. All right, thanks to you. Okay. Thank you. We now take our next question from Michael Hutner from JP Morgan. Fantastic, thank you, and, and well done. Lovely results. Um, the, 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 the three questions. One is, uh, what would Somsi be now? Um, the second is, um, the um, uh, if I look at the bigger picture, you know, you have these big budgets for digital and, and, and maybe IFRS 17. I just wonder how you see those developing, whether they would put uh, your nice um, trend of falling costs uh, under pressure. And the third question, you explained that uh, PIMCO rising interest rates ultimately is positive. Can you maybe shed some light and say what would be a, a kind of crossover point, um, however you define it? it it's, I, 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 you know, uh, from short-term pressure versus long-term. Thank you. Well, if I got your first question was about what is the solvency tool now. That was the first yes, question. Please. So, like, uh, I, I would say as of October, I would expect the solvency tool you know, from a market movement point of view, to be unchanged, and then clearly we had the business evolution kicking in. Uh, the point is there was a widening of the credit spreads in um, in Italy, so there will be, if you want, the, ne the negative. But we we are underweighted in Italy compared to the Europa portfolio. So from that point of view, since we have like a a basis issue between or you know, advantage between what happens to the uh, Europa reference portfolio, credit spread widening in Italy doesn't affect us so much, and on top of it, right now, if the spreads are staying at the level they are, the uh, country uh, VA will be triggered. So in reality, we might even have a positive impact as of now from the change in credit spread. But if you ask me, I would say, let's say, it's, let's call it a, a neutral impact, so no no kind of issue on our solvency too because of the credit spread widening. And it's also very important for, for you to know at the end of the day when we are 20 to under 30 percent solvency ratio, a couple of percentage point more or less of solvency ratio doesn't doesn't really make a big difference. But the solvency is very strong, and we don't see anything uh, affecting that in a substantial way because of the market movement as of now. The other question was about the IFRS 17, and uh, you are asking me whether this is going to have a cost impact on our group. Let's put it clearly: we are paying this um, money, but you know, we are a huge organization, and if we are not capable to absorb the cost of implementing FRS 17 and 9, I, I would be <laughs> very surprised. So from that point of view, sure, we need to also set priorities. If we are implementing FRS 17, we are now maybe going to do other things that we would do, also because of the resource issue, more than of a cost issue, but this is definitely not something which is uh, changing our, it can have any kind of impact on our profitability, so that's uh, not an issue at all. The final point was on the PIMCO. 
Now, I, you know, your question about the crossover, I cannot clearly answer you in a, in a, in a you know, give you a number, but at the end of the day, it's very simple. When rates go up, clearly you can see a, a, a dry, dry up of the flows. I just give you an idea. If you had 10 billion less of flows, for example, on a run rate, assuming you do nothing, that would be mean 20 million less profit for run rate for annual profit. Um, then you might see a little bit of clearly when you see an increase in the in the interest rate, the asset basis can go down. So you can, if you if you want to look that way, you could also say that it's an increase of 50 basis points, considering lower flows and uh, a change in asset base can make about uh, 50 million less less operating profit on annual basis, assuming you do nothing. And I would say this is very easy to recapture once the situation stabilizes because you get the flows back very quickly and the assets under management are getting higher crediting. That's the reason why I strongly believe that the short term, you know, reduction of operating profit, assuming you do nothing, by the way, can be uh, easily compensated on a present value uh, terms, but the expectation that the Business is becoming more appealing once the rates are up and also the accrual that you have on the assets under management and think about the amount of assets under management we have is going to be stronger. So for me, it's a clear positive once rates go up, uh, but clearly first you need to, to go through some sort of volatility. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now our next question from Peter Elliott from Kepler Schiffer. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, three questions, please. Um, the first one, um, just on expenses again. I mean, uh, Michael was asking about uh, you know, the future costs, but if I look at your current uh, ratio, which is obviously very good again this quarter, um, you said at uh, Q2, I think that uh, you know we might get a bit of sort of relaxing of discipline since the, the target was sort of in the bag, but we've seen quite quite the opposite. Um, I'm just wondering if you could sort of say, you know, to what extent do you think this is a sort of normal level? Are there any one-offs in there? Um, you know, in, in the short term, is there any reason that, you know, this should or shouldn't uh, continue? Um, then the second question on uh, on life. Um, uh, I mean, since you were invited to questions uh, on long-term care, I'll give you the opportunity to, to talk about uh, uh, that and, uh, uh, yeah, perhaps any comfort. Uh, I mean, it doesn't seem a very big number, as you say, so, so any comfort you can give us that, uh, so that so that's fully put to bed. Um, and then maybe finally, um, just on your investment strategy in general, I'm just wondering if there's sort of any change in view at all, you know, even at the margin in terms of where you like to put your money. I mean, obviously, alternative investments infrastructure have been a, a big focus. I guess, you know, we had one unfortunate event over the, the summer, um, but just generally, you know, whether, whether there's any sort of change in strategy there at all. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. So let's start from the expenses. Maybe what I, I, you know, what I meant in the second quarter was not that discipline is going to reduce. In reality, we are totally focused on uh, expense uh, productivity, expense uh, management. So this is going to stay, and it's going to stay for a long time. Um, the point I was making, usually, especially towards the end of the year, in the last quarter, you might have the accrual kicking kick in, because as, as, as much as you try to do accrual over the year, you have um, a clear kicking in uh, over proportional if you want at the end of the year and also a lot of marketing activities can take place at the end of the year so there's not and also clearly when you have such a focus on the expense ratio uh, companies are going to be what they want to be very sure that they can uh, meet their their target but I wouldn't interpret that as a you know we have discipline then we take the discipline out it's more a sort of natural development that you you might see so the discipline is going to stay. I can give you an idea. By the end of the year, I believe we have a target of 28.4. I'm pretty confident at this point in time that we're going to beat the 28.4. If I should give you a guidance, I would say at this point in time it might be even 28.2, but I don't want, you know, you never know. It's very difficult to predict a number to the, to the uh, 10 basis point, but we feel that we should be able to beat our uh, target. Uh, significantly, and then clearly we want to get better as we move into 2019 and 2020. So the idea, as we discussed uh, several times, is 
to get a productivity improvement year after year, not to adjust a, a big one shot, and then we we go back maybe the year after in the other direction. So that's the way uh, we look at productivity improvement over over time. The other uh, point was about the LTC business. Okay, first of all, I'll give you some numbers so that you have a little bit of an idea of what we are talking about. On a gross basis, we have about uh, 4.5 billion euro of reserves. And when you look in reality at what is the net, so what is uh, our uh, retention, if you want, because we have a huge uh, reinsurance program, we have about 1.3 uh, billion, which is uh, uh, retained. That's also very important. The part which is uh, uh, reinsured is the business before 2002, so which is indeed a business which was more challenging because there was a time, a point in time where the market realized that LTC was not pricing properly. So all the business which is before 2002, in reality, is completely reinsured. The business after 2002, which is not necessarily profitable, but is definitely way better compared to the business before 2002, in this case, we have, uh, for that business, we have uh, an insurance which is about 20%. So it's mostly all uh, retained. So what we do, in reality, we do this every every year. We go through a review of the assumption. So we, we review the morbidity, mortality assumption. We also review what is the improvement that we or deterioration that we are assuming this assumption. And this year, based on uh, the uh, statistics and analysis that we, we got, we we determined that uh, we had to to change the gross premium valuation, or the gross premium valuation changed to a level, because that was changed also in the in the past, but now it changed to a level that has triggered a loss recognition, which is about a uh, little bit below 40 million uh, euro. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, we have the ability in uh, the United States to increase uh, tariff. So as we are going to look at what happens in the future, and we might also see, you know, deterioration, mobility, and mortality in the future, we have also uh, some ability to compensate uh, future deterioration to, through uh, rate changes. So at the end of the day, based on the analysis, we determined that there was uh, a, a necessity to, to uh, increase, if you want, reserve by about a uh, little bit more than 30 million uh, euro. And I would tell you, it's uh, from my standpoint, is a very small amount. And uh, you know, I was hinting to that before. So the operating profit of Allianz lie for the quarter has been pretty much in line with plane. So this tells you that even at Allianz life level, they had the ability to sustain such, such kind of impacts very easily. From an Allianz group point of view, honestly speaking, this is uh, a very, you know, think about a big claim in PNC can be easy, easily be 40 million. So I would say for me, this is really nothing uh, uh, to be concerned about. There was another question. Ah, the investment, sorry. The yeah, last question, investment. No, we are not really changing uh, our strategy. As you know, we have a strategy anyway to increase the allocation to alternative, which was about 110 billion uh, in 2017. We want to go all the way up to 150 billion. So we are continuing in the next few years. So we are continuing with this strategy. Otherwise, from an asset, asset allocation, the sense of how much equity we have, uh, uh, fixed income, we are pretty much uh, standing the, the course. So there is no, we are not going to change our our strategy based on some volatility you might have uh, at a certain point in time in the market because clearly we always take a longer term view and especially, you know, we position our portfolio based on the level of, uh, what kind of level of solvency tool we have, what are the sensitivity. Insolvency tool. This is what is driving our strategic asset allocation. Clearly, you can always say some tactical adjustment, but these tactical tactical adjustment are not necessarily changing the the big picture. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Sorry for my wording on discipline. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And now we would take a question from William Hawking from KBW. 
Hi, thank you very much. Hi, Julio. Um, I'd like Hi. to go back to um, uh, Thomas Seidel's question about the um, investment margin on slide 25. Um, in, in the past 18 months, the shareholder's share of the gross margin has risen quite significantly. Uh, prior to that, it had been stable in about the mid-30s, and now it's in the high 40s. Um, can you just remind us why that's happened, um, and what does it mean for the future? Do we expect the current level to stay, um, or could it be rising or falling? Um, and then also, you know, um, your published remarks in the slide presentation um, imply that the investment margin could be improving in the fourth quarter to hit your 90 basis point target. But when you were answering Thomas, you sounded um, appropriately more cautious about the ongoing hedging costs. So I'm just wondering, is there another positive that offsets that that makes you optimistic in, in the slide comment, um, or, or should we treat that with caution? And then secondly, um, can you help me on, on the growth on P&C? Um, it, it's very clear that you're proud of the 6% growth, and that's very good. Um, but I've spent a lot of time learning that growth in non-life can be the number one warning signal um, for the outlook for profitability. I know the current combined ratio is great. So what would you recommend that I look at on a forward-looking basis to say, yes, this growth is good quality growth, rather than you're storing up problems for the future? Thank you. Okay, so the first question was about uh, the margin, right? Yeah. So we, we don't necessarily see the trend that you are describing, but maybe I got, because when we, when we do our calculation of what is the policy or the sharing, we are, uh, at the, uh, the minimum guarantee, the profit sharing divided by the total yield, and when we do this kind of calculation, we don't see necessarily the trend. I understand based on what you said, maybe you're doing the calculation profit sharing over gross investment margin. If you do that kind of calculation, then clearly you're going to see a little bit of a different trend, because, but that's a, almost a mathematical issue. So, but uh, the way we do the calculation, we look at the total uh, yield, and then we sum up minimum guarantee and profit sharing. I think that's the best uh, way to look at it. If you look your way, by definition, as there is some compression between uh, between um, uh, current yield and guarantee, once you keep the total participation constant, automatically you're going to have, based on the calculation, you do a little bit of a compression. But, you know, it's just a matter how you do the math. When we do the math in the sense of that's the total yield, and this is how much we are giving to the policy order from a guarantee plus profit sharing, this number is pretty consistent. And I would say that's uh, also the way, you know, I would look at the number. But the implication is, yes, uh, you are somehow giving less uh, profit sharing to the, to the policy order if you want. But you are not giving less of the pie in total. You, you got my point? William? I think so. I might come back okay. offline. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So that's one. On the other one, oh, the 90 basis point. I will be a little bit cautious from that point of view because I don't think that, you know, we're going to necessarily reverse the trend in the fourth quarter. This said, I, 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 the point is how do we feel about getting to our 4.2 billion outflow? We feel pretty, pretty good about that. But from a pure investment margin point of view, yes, I will be likely, uh, kind of cautious for the fourth quarter. That's what's important to me. That's not really a target because, honestly speaking, if that will be a target, we can get to the number. That's more a guidance as how we try to explain how our numbers are coming up together. But I wouldn't define that as a target because if we start defining that as a target, then well, we can make the number. But then we go into the conversation about how we are treating the policy or all, all, all these kind of things. So I would say the guidance is supposed to be a, a target. It's more an explanatory number as opposed to be a target. Um, and the other point was on the growth in PNC. I think I have a good answer for the first part, less for a second. I don't know what to give you to look uh, up front from your, your standpoint to um, whether the growth is, uh, is good or not. We, clearly, internally, we are very aware that uh, if you're chasing the wrong uh, customer, this can be very costly. So we are uh, very much focused on looking at, uh, you know, what kind of uh, business we are taking in. We can definitely look at the excellent year performance. We, we do analysis also uh, with our trial team in Munich. So we internally, we have a good view on... Uh, on the kind of growth we are uh, getting. Clearly, we are always very uh, cautious about looking at this number. What I can give to you 
to look at uh, to look at that i i would say i i unless i start sharing with you our internal information that would be very very difficult yeah maybe you can do it on the 30th that'll be helpful okay <laughs> thank you very much yeah I'm sorry yeah thank you very much and we will now take a question from andrew ricci from autonomous Oh, hi there. Um, just first of all on PNC, I'm, I'm not entirely clear. Was the man-made large loss experience in the discrete Q3 uh, above expectations or above long-term expectations or about in line? And just related to large losses, there were quite a lot of large losses man-made in the market, uh, but, it, but it doesn't seem to have particularly affected your result. I understand you have very low per risk retention. Is there additional uh, man-made aggregate protection in place, or, or, or some other, uh, you know, additional protection on, on, on man-made losses? Um, second question on Italy. I appreciate the impact of spread widening is, is, is minimal at the group level, but, but clearly it won't be at the Italia Allianz Italia. Um, that business has paid pretty decent dividends to the group in recent years. At what point would there be an issue, do you think, about um, continuing to withdraw a decent dividend? Thanks. Yeah, so starting from the large losses, I would say our experience in the third quarter was, uh, and we have also the comment somehow, was slightly above what we would expect uh, normally, but, you know, I'm not speaking of a huge deviation, but there was you know, I would say some kind of deviation. In the sense of um, what we do from a reinsurance point of view, I wouldn't say that we have a um, particular particular program, but uh, we have a, a 150 million uh, reinsurance protection in excess of 150. That's what we are doing. But I was I wouldn't say that we have a particular particular law, you know, particular protection that we we buy on man made from a reinsurance point of view. So I think it's a, it has more to do with the underwriting discipline and uh, maybe the retention that we have really at the, because what I'm referring to is a sort of uh, insurance program group level, and then clearly you have the kind of retention that you take at the local level on single on single uh, risk that you are underwriting. So from that point of view, I'm, I'm talking, sure you mean gross retention to the two levels of protection, one of the reinsurance, yeah. but you're taking relatively small lines itself? Yeah, that's the point, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's it. Okay. So, so, the, so uh, overall the experience was average, more or less? Slightly above what you would expect, but I, I was a cl close to average and slightly, slightly above what we expect in a quarter, but nothing, nothing uh, substantial uh, more than that. Okay. Yeah. The other question was about Italy and uh, the dividend, right? So as uh, clearly, as, as you have a, a increase in, uh, in, in spread, it is going to have an impact on the sovereignty to level. But from a dividend point of view, uh, we, we see that also when we put the plan together, uh, the dividend plan is not affected by that. If you have then a, and that's assuming there is no change in the country VA, Clearly, there is a reduction in the excess capital. So from that point of view, if you have some nice idea about uh, excess capital upstreaming, that can be a little bit reduced, but the dividend is a different different story. Now, that's the beauty. When rates are going up, there is a point where you get, in reality, the uh, country VA, and this would even create excess capital. So from that point of view, it depends on where you are. It might be a little bit of a dampening on excess capital repatriation, or it can also be that this dampening on excess capital repatriation is removed. From a stable dividend point of view, I would say at the point where we are right now, we, we don't see any, any impacts on, uh, on the expected amount of dividends. So there is a little bit of a hedging, if you want, because of the VA, country VA. Great, that's very clear. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please press star 1. To withdraw a question from the queue, please press star 2. We now take a question from Nick Holmes from Societe Generale. 
Oh, hi there. Thank you very much. I wanted okay. to ask, um, with US Life, how comfortable are you with the very high growth in fixed index annuity products in the US? I, I ask because these aren't really capital light, are they? Or do you disagree with that? And then secondly, another one on US Life. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the new FASB changes to US GAAP? Will they make uh, US Life reporting more volatile, do you think? Thank you. Yeah, let me start from the second one. You know, in reality, we don't need to submit US GAAP anymore because we have talked to the ACC and we can, for our filing, we have a special filing for some products, we can use statutory accounting. So from that point of view, that's not a, an issue for us. We've been working for many, many years. Indeed, I was still in Minneapolis when we tried to get the, the statutory account instead of the US GAAP to be utilized, and now finally we've been able to get this approval from the ACC. So US GAAP is not going to be relevant if you want uh, for, for us. And by the way, even in the past, since there was just a filing, uh, it was not really something that we were using for performance measurement, and it's not relevant from a solvency point of view. In reality, those numbers were not really impacting our decision making. But anyway, right now we, we don't try to, to submit any USK moving uh, forward. On the business uh, and the FIA business, uh, I feel pretty comfortable, obviously, about what we're doing there on the FIA side. Uh, your question whether they are uh, light or not, uh, you know, I would differentiate. From an economic point of view, they are uh, capital light products. There is no doubt because the level of guarantee is so low that if you run an economic calculation, you can see that uh, there is not much capital required. And they tell you even more. That's uh, something that we can see in the modeling we are doing now. Uh, you can see, uh, and we could see this even when I joined Allianz, uh, I would say 15 years ago, on an economic model, the kind of uh, the kind of product is very uh, 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 light. From a statutory point of view, it's a little bit of a different story. Then, from a statutory point of view, I would say yes, sure, you have some capital intensity. On the other side, the business is so large now, and the uh, enforced profitability is significant that uh, you know there is enough capacity to produce profit on the enforced to also absorb what could be the, the impact on uh, the requir requirement because of the growth in the business. And then I always like to say as long as you price at an ROE, which is about IRR, which is 13% unlevered, honestly speaking, I think it's a good uh, good business to put in your, in your book. So your, the answer is economically capital light. From a statutory point of view, I wouldn't define this as capital light, but we are pricing at a nice ROE. And so I, I think it's a, it's a good, um, a good business. Uh, thank you for that. that that's uh, very interesting. Can I follow up just with one quick question, which is, Judo, could you remind us what the guarantee actually is in basic form? Because I mean, they, they get quite complicated, don't they? Now I'm not quite sure where you are with your latest products. Okay, when you look at the uh, crediting, you know, they say that the guarantee. Are could be 20, 30 basis points, so it's really low. Now you can run a calculation where you can assume what happens to the, you know, you have like the withdrawal payments and what happens to, in, in the case, no policy order going to lapse and you put a mortality assumption. In that case, you're going to get closer to, I would say, guarantee, which is about 1.5%. But the, the, what I would say could be a, a, an implied level of guarantee. In the case, you're assuming really there is no lapsation, nothing, and uh, then you need to make a, an assumption about the mortality of people, and then you can say there would be the, uh, the maximum level of guarantee. Okay. Thank you. Very clear. Okay. Thank you. We now take <coughs> our next question from Vinit Malhotra from Medio Banker. Yes, good afternoon, Julio. Hi. Uh, so Hi. A few questions, please. Hi. So, firstly, just on the, just, just focusing on the BNC growth, which is, of course, an amazing number. Uh, what I notice is that the Euro Hermes, for example, after the minority buyout, there's been a really strong pickup in Euro Hermes. Now, what I'm trying to understand is that is this growth 
just because uh, some of the competitors of those are distracted, either in global lines or with their regional markets, or and you are a strong in a stronger position, so you can push. Uh, or do you think it is just that the business is, the, you know, the economy or some other effect? So I just want to understand how much of the growth is because you seem to be in a stronger position. And the Euro Hermes was just an example, but if any comments, I'd be great to. Um, the second thing is that uh, on the life side, again, I'm just curious about one thing, that the, uh, the target of preferred products, for example, capital efficient products, the target for new business is being met, you know, the 80% or so, uh, but the operating profit of new business, uh, of the capital efficient product, as an example, is quite uh, sort of stuck in a very, you know, like 200 million range for several quarters now. Um, what should we think about? Uh, is it that the new business value growth of 16% is going to ultimately help the life earnings in future, or how should we think about this given this sort of stable capital efficient product profit and operating level? Thank you. That's from you, AMS. <laughs> I'm going to make a joke now. Don't <laughs> the difference between now and before, before the company was listed, so management has to do a lot of conference calls, and now they can focus on running the business. But it's just a joke. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> no, the reality is the, the, the economy, definitely the economy is helping. The economy is pretty strong, and so from that point of view, uh, this is... Um, helping definitely the, the business, also the franchise is pretty strong, but I, I, I wouldn't uh, say that because of the getting to, the rating has been upgraded, that's also, uh, I think there was also an upgrading rating as we did the transaction, so all these kind of things are helping, but clearly the economy has been uh, has been definitely also helping the performance on the top line of Euler, Euler Hermes. Uh, in the case of um, the capital life products and the, the operating profit development is a few comments. And the point is, but you're going to see that that number is going to pick up. In reality, what is happening right now uh, on the uh, capital life products that we are writing in Allianz Germany, we are not getting a lot of uh, profit. And if you want, this is also it's, it's part of, of a function of how the accounting works, and that's also part of the function how we do the allocation of profit between uh, between if you want the different segments. So from that point of view, I, I would even say that we are uh, most likely a little bit understating what the amount of profit could be on uh, on that uh, line of business. Over time, you're going definitely to see that the performance coming from uh, Germany and the capital life products is going to kick in, and then you're going to see more substantial numbers in that uh, line of business. So uh, it's just a matter of uh, be patient. The numbers are going to uh, to come through. Uh, uh, they are going to become visible. Thanks. And just on the broader topic of growth and competition, is there some element of you being able to push harder because you are in a stronger position than peers or or something like that that you can see? You, you mean in general for in, in, in general? general? PNC, in PNC, so, you know, because the fact that your, with your size you grow 6% or, you know, whatever, that kind of range for three quarters mm -hmm. now, so it's quite remarkable, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, if you if you look in the past, we were anyway growing 3%, so it's not that we were growing at zero. And now we are really, you know, a few companies who are, which are performing better compared to the past. So if you take Germany from 2 to 4, this makes a difference. If you take Italy from negative to positive, this uh, makes a, a, a difference. Also, I think in general the economy is somehow stronger. So there's also some lift that you get on the PNC side. So I, I would say it's a combination clearly of, uh, in general, some more momentum, and then we are getting a few companies to perform at a different level compared to how they were performing before, and then the other companies are also pushing a little bit stronger. So it's usually when you get a you know combination of everything going the, in the same in the right direction that you get to this kind of uh, growth rates. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And now we take a question from Farouk Hanif from Credit Suisse. Hi. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on uh, on German combined ratio, um, you had a, a four-point improvement on the attritional loss ratio, and you make the comment that it's kind of lower whether or not you claims than losses. Um, but I just kind of want to know uh, what proportion of that four points is, is that, and how much of this is kind of the improvement of pricing, and how much of it is temporary. Um, and, and then second question on capital generation, there's obviously two, so that, that's tracking better um, in, in the quarter, uh, and, and I suspect it's helped by both PNC and by, by life new business. I was wondering, do you think, do you think third quarter is a, is a good reflection of how it may continue? Um, that's it, really. Thank you. Well, uh, sorry, on the service the question with, uh, was whether on the so, business yeah, evolution. Yeah. Capital generation, yeah, <coughs> very strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was, yes. Exactly. Yes, I would say, you know, when you take the 9% and you remove uh, dividend taxes, we are at about 3%, so I would say that broadly this could be also an expectation for uh, for the future. We, we, we know our guidance was about 10% per annum, so that now I would say this is somehow the guidance that I would uh, still, uh, still keep in mind, so it's about 2.5% per, per quarter. Uh, um, that could be yeah, the expectation that we have moving moving forward. So we, we are not really changing what we said at the beginning of the year. And that's, uh, the other question was on the German uh, combined ratio, loss ratio. One quarter of the improvements of the four percentage point improvement is driven by attritional, and um, I would say three quarters driven just by weather related large uh, large losses. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And we now take a question from James Cook from City. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, three questions uh, from my side, please. Um, firstly, um, just thinking about um, you know, how you communicated around the, the, the outlook around expenses, because you know, I, I think you've acknowledged that um, structurally expenses need to come down quite significantly, and particularly in PNC I'm really referring to. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of just want to think about how you um, manage the, the, the kind of reduction in the overall combined ratio and balance that with the growth outlook. Um, you know, as we've talked about quite a lot on this call, you know, you, you're growing close to 6%. You previously guided in, in, in most of your outlook um, statements for kind of 3% growth. So clearly a step up. I just wanted to get a feel for how you think about managing that combined ratio in the context of growth. So is there scope for the 94 still to be driven down and, and grow, or, or how, how do you manage those two things? Um, second question, as you've already alluded to, you know, there are some companies that are performing on a different level. Um, Spain, CEE, Germany, Italy, you know, all looking very good and showing good signs of productivity uh, gains, of, which, which is what you've been targeting. I guess from here, um, you know, what are the next lines of businesses and territories that we should keep an eye on, which are closest to, you know, really delivering? Is, is it really about finding a key to each market, or are you starting to leverage the scale of the group um, more effectively, and, and, and which, are the, which are the areas we should keep an eye on? Um, final question, just around AGCFs, um, really. I mean, strong organic growth in the period. Um, I, I guess there's a lot happening in terms of specialty at the moment. Um, some players are adopting more of an integrated insurance, reinsurance um, strategy. Um, what would a kind of, a, you know, a, a greater alternative capital um, capabilities um, and perhaps a bigger third-party reinsurance business, what would that actually bring to AGCS? Is this organic growth that we're seeing, is it genuinely sustainable, um, or is AGCS going to get left behind a little bit over the medium term? Thank you. Okay, so starting from um, uh, the question was about the uh, experience ratio of reviewer debts and combining with growth and, and all this kind of uh, consideration. Uh, first of all, clearly we want to reduce the expense ratio. We don't want to reduce the expense ratio at the cost of uh, investing the business, if that was your question, because I tell you, we can get to an expense ratio which is way lower very quickly, we decide to uh, compromise on uh, building up uh, the business for the future. So that's and that's a, uh, the challenge. If you want, is really reduce the expense ratio and still find the ability to accommodate uh, 
uh, growth initiative. But we are setting our, our, as a goal that we, by doing, by doing both, we still want the experience ratio to go to go down. But clearly, if we were to focus only on reducing the experience ratio and without any consideration for investing in the business, then we could bring this number down very, very, uh, very quickly. In the sense of how we are looking for uh, to the combined ratio also for the future, I would say for that anyway we can, uh, you know, I'm sure you're going to come to the Capital Market Day, so on that one we're going to provide guidance. But you can imagine that, you know, uh, we will like to get uh, better compared to where we are right now, but for more guidance come to the in the capital market here, we're going to give you more specific uh, input on this issue. And then the other one was on the PNC, how we look at performance and what we should be looking at. You know, in reality, we look at everything because I, I just give you an example. Even in Spain, where we have a very good performance, and you were mentioning that, they are still getting better. And we still believe we can get better, even on the experience ratio. And what we are doing right now, we we are doing also a lot of benchmarking where we are moving from uh, uh, benchmarking us to the average of the market, and we are going for uh, the so-called best in class. So when you do these kind of things, you you can get uh, performance improvement almost in every organization, clearly depending on the quality of the organization, you might have more or less of a performance uh, improvement. But I, I believe there is still a potential to get better. Also, as I said, there are some segments where our profitability has not been as good as other segments. I'll give you an example, Midcorp, where we are now putting a lot of effort to get a better profitability. And based on the plan that we are discussing right now, we see also better numbers for the future. So uh, the franchise is very strong. This doesn't mean that uh, we are perfect, right? So there is definitely always the possibility to get better results. And by the way, since you were mentioning GCS, that's also definitely a company where we can get better than 104 combined ratio, just, just to look at the number. So think about that we had this quarter a 93.1 combined ratio for the group, even if a GCS was a 104. And you can imagine what would be if a GCS would have, would have had a combined ratio 96, just to put a number there. So there is room for improvement. Uh, on your question about the alternative capital, these kind of things, I'm personally not a big fan. Every time I'm hearing about alternative capital, Bermuda, I see low ROE, uh, uh, volatility, interest parents, kind of, you know, kind of financial engineering. So from that point of view, it's not necessarily uh, the kind of, you know, business that is will be on top of my list as I think about uh, opportunity. This said, I will never say never because there can be exception. But, you know, if we are just looking big picture, I'm not waking up in the morning thinking we need to do some alternative capital in uh, in Bermuda. Uh, and, 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 and likewise, kind of no real plans to accelerate the growth of third-party reinsurance and, you know, folding that within AGCS? No, really. So we do some third-party insurance, definitely, and also profitable, but we, we don't have place now to do uh, substantial more compared to what we are doing now. So we, 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 we continue with the strategy that we had in place, so we do it, but not big place to make a big, uh, big change there. Okay, thank you very much, Julian. Welcome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As another reminder to ask a question, please press star 1. To withdraw a question, please press star 2. We now take a question from Michael Hutner from JP Morgan. Oh, thank you so much. That's a, it was really a very, very lightweight question. What, um, you were talking about guarantees and stuff, and I just wondered whether you can, uh, you, you can say what the average guarantee is now uh, for your uh, life book and, and what it was before to give a, a feeling for it. Um, I'd like to think of other questions, but I have nothing. Thank you. So maybe the way to answer the question, if you, when you look at the 49 basis points, yeah. And then you can pretty much annualize that. That would be potentially, from an FRS point of view, the kind of average guarantee. This is not necessarily the economic guarantee. So it's not necessarily the economic guarantee to be, to be perfectly frank. But from an FRS point of view, you could say this is the kind of guarantee 
that is embedded in the calculation. And so it's about 2%. It's about 2%. And how much, how much is this down, um, or how quickly is this coming down? Oh, you see, for example, in uh, a few years ago, just uh, three, four years ago, was about 2.5. So it's coming down uh, consistently. If I look at it, because sometimes it's easier when you look at the uh, book by book. When I look at the uh, Allianz Leben book, the number is coming down, I believe, 20 basis points per annum. So then you need to also consider, you know, different kind of mix that you might have as different countries uh, coming in. But when you look at the development in uh, Allianz Leben, for example, you can see that the guarantee is dropping significantly every 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 year. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next question now from Michael van Wegen from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, uh, Julio. Uh, one quick question. Um, on the long-term care book, um, the assumption changes that you've made, are you still assuming uh, morbidity improvement, or has this now been changed to um, a stable level? The reason why I'm asking is that a number of um, the U.S. players have made this adjustment uh, as the NEIC is looking into this. So just wondering whether that is already part of the 36 million or, or might still be coming. Thank you. Now we have also looked at that and we have also made a change to that. So we have changed the assumption that we see right now based on the experience that we see right now, but we have also changed somehow what could be the uh, morbidity improvement implied for the future. So we looked at both. And we made a change to both and so now what we are going to do anyway, and we, we have been done this uh, every year, we are going to continue to look at what kind of information we, we get. And uh, again, as I was saying before, we had the ability to increase rates. And then we need to see how these two things are going to play out as, uh, as we go through the next, uh, the next years. But we, we are looking at all assumptions. We have been changing uh, all assumptions. So showing up to what this well, is right now. Sorry, are you still expecting an, an, an improvement in morbidity, though, at this stage, or no longer? Yeah, no, we still expect some improvement, yeah. We didn't remove completely the, the improvement in morbidity, but we have reduced uh, the amount of improvement that we might see in the future. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we take a question from Michael Haidt from Commerzbank. <coughs> yes, good afternoon. Um, just uh, one question from my side. On PNC, the expense ratio reduction, 80 basis points, um, you, you say that 30 basis points come from admin and 50 basis points comes from acquisition expense ratio reduction. Is there a reason why the – or what is the reason why the ex acquisition expense ratio reduced? Um, admin is clear, but the uh, acquisition expense ratio comes a little bit surprising. Any one-offs in there? But there is also, yeah, there is also, we did something in Germany on the acquisition side, but, uh, on the commission side, so this has also an impact there. And if you want, to a certain degree, for the court, there's also a, a, let's say there is a little bit of one-off. But the point is, when we speak of acquisition expenses, in reality, acquisition expenses is not only commission. So, you know, we had the administrative expenses, and the acquisition expense is going to be the sum of commission, and all the kind of expenses in the company which are related anyway to acquiring the business. So in reality, you have also a large component, if you want, of expenses which are similar to what, you know, in the nature of being fixed versus variable, they are similar to administrative expenses. So you need to keep in mind for that. Other point, and that's always very important, and that's really important to me, when you look at a ratio of alliance, considering the mix, you know, you, you just need to have a little bit more of a growth in a, in especially a, on a quarterly basis. You just need to have a little bit more growth in a, in a company as opposed to the other. You're going to have a different commission mix. So more, you should be always very cautious, especially when you start comparing 10 basis points up and down. Because that can be, we, we are spending a lot of time, I tell you, in analyzing our numbers in and out, 
And uh, it's very interesting when you start to look at the numbers and you start removing what is the impact of insurance, what is the impact of mix. Then you, you can see how you might have a change in expense ratio of 10, 20 basis points, which is just driven by different mix and has nothing to do in reality with productivity improvement. So always take this number with some sort of, you know, look at the trend over time, look at the magnitude, but don't overemphasize 10 or 20 basis points. It's possible in a quarter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, I would say 50 basis points is quite a lot. Uh, but nevertheless, what is the, the issue in Germany? Uh, we did some change to the commission, and that, that well, that's what we did in Germany. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we now take a follow-up question from Vinit Malhotra from Medio Banka. Yes, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> this one thing that struck me I didn't ask earlier. The PIMCO outflow of 10 billion you pointed out in October, um, is that, you think, just the volatility effect or rates effect? Because rates haven't, it's not that big. So, and it's important to understand your thoughts on this because rates are here to probably stay longer, uh, up, you know, but volatility could even vanish or, you know, change. So just wondered what you thought of between these two factors. Uh, okay, the 10 billion is just uh, the, the volatility on the inflows. But, you know, remember, uh, this quarter, last quarter was positive, the second quarter was negative. You can see this kind of volatility. And the second quarter was negative because of the volatility that we had uh, in February, March. But that's just uh, flaws. So as you clearly, when investors have an expectation that rates are going up, no, they're going to wait a couple of months before they start putting the, the, the money into a, a bond fund. That's all what is happening. You know, people are taking position to say, okay, let me wait that uh, rates are up, and then they're going to start investing. So the 10 billion was referring to is uh, simply lower lower uh, uh, flows, and it's not to do with the change in the asset basis. <clears throat> that was your question? Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering between volatility and rate expectations, which is the bigger <coughs> driver of it. It looks like volatility at the moment. Yeah, it's volatility, yeah. But for me, yeah, definitely volatility, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But it's driven by, you know, the fact that interest rates are going up. This movement is uh, driving some volatility in the in the flows on a quarterly basis. Yeah, I'm referring to volatility in the market. Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, we have um, we have time for one last question. If there's any. As there are no further questions at this time. I will now like to hand back to Oliver Schmidt for any additional or closing remarks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steffi. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody for joining the call, um, and thank you for your interest. Um, we wish you a very pleasant weekend, and say goodbye for now. Bye. Good afternoon.